Let's get into it. In terms of enduring understandings, I first and foremost want to make clear that a major component of Zionism broadly has been a process of creating a revolutionary Jewish culture in the land of Israel in order to safeguard Jewish existence. And central to this talk, this is a culture that has modern Hebrew at its core. With that said, different groups of Jews over time from around the world, in Europe, in Middle East, in other continents have brought with them unique backgrounds, languages, religious practices, and cultural elements that over time have created the layers that are Israeli culture. And very important to that and considering that there continue to be new immigrants and groups within Israel that are evolving from the inside and from the outside, Israeli culture is a constantly evolving and unfinished project. And this likewise includes the 21% of Arab Palestinian population of Israel. Now, when I say Arab Palestinian, I think it is important to clarify that within this sector of Israeli society, there are varying degrees of identification with the Palestinian national cause. For example, if you speak to many Bedouin in the South, they don't necessarily identify with the Palestinian national cause, although some do. Um, but based on my personal experience, it can vary. So to begin, we're essentially looking in a very basic context in the beginning of understanding Hebrew culture at this transition from the photo we see on the right, the more traditional shtetl aesthetic of European Jewry to the image we see on the left where we have a bronzed and brawny agricultural working new Jew. And in understanding what happens to European Jewry in the 19th century, we can begin to unpack those layers of what is happening nationally and culturally that contributes to the ultimate creation of what is known as the new Jew. And when I say creation, invention of national cultures happened across Europe in the 19th century. And so where does Zionism and Hebrew culture fit into this notion of invented cultures? And why would I use a term like invention to describe the creation of Hebrew and Israeli culture? First of all, there's a book written by Eric Hobsbawm and Ranger called The Invention of Tradition. This is a very important book in cultural history. And while I don't agree with all of their analyses, especially as they relate to the development of Hebrew culture, it is very important to remember that Modern Hebrew did not exist before the Zionist movement. Modern Israeli national culture did not exist until it was created by those architects of the Zionist enterprise and those cultural elements within it. And so, for example, when we look at this center photograph of pre-state Hebrew dance, it's important to remember that what was folk dance at that point was an amalgam of German folk culture, of Russian folk culture, of many different broad strokes of European folk culture that were essentially combined as different stages of immigrants came to Palestine from Europe in the pre-state period, fusing that with local elements that they were absorbing from local culture and likewise things that they were creating over time as new immigrants were coming. Now on the right, we see a more developed form of the folk dance that was being performed in this photo in the center, but it's important to remember that this was a process of creating a culture, a national culture, and a language that did not exist prior to Zionism. And this is something that very much fits into a phenomenon that was happening across Europe, where, for example, in France, it's not the case that everyone in the geographic area that we know of as France today spoke what we know of as modern French. It is the case that modern French is based on the dialect of French that was spoken in the area around Paris. And as part of creating the national culture of France, everyone adopted that language. And so too was the case 
with creating modern Hebrew culture where it did have to be created. Now, where do we see this coming from? It's important to look at Judaism's encounter with modernism in Europe and what really happened as Jews began to become emancipated. And what do I mean by emancipation? In France, for example, in 1790, when the Sephardi Jews, and then in 1791, when the Ashkenazi Jews, and in Germany in 1848, when we see Jews become emancipated. We see a transition where Jewish communities in Europe that had been living essentially under contracts with monarchs where the leadership of the Jewish communities would negotiate with the monarchs as to how many Jews could live in certain areas, what those Jews could do for work, how they could travel, and many aspects of their lives were dictated by these negotiated contracts. And upon emancipation, it's important to remember that Jews became citizens of these newly emerging nation states, but it is not necessarily the case that they were seen as equal to those other citizens that were not Jewish. So I have a question here. How do you differentiate between a crafted modern culture and accusations of cultural appropriation? It's a great question. It's a very nuanced question. There's a lot of literature written about this, but I think it's the case that almost all things that we know to be modern elements of various cultures were created at a time. And so do you consider pasta in the Italian context to be an appropriated element of Italian culinary culture because the noodle was invented in Asia? I don't have an answer for you, but that is certainly something that you can toil over. And I'd be curious to, to hear your thoughts after the presentation. So just to give a basic idea as well that alongside these emerging nation states in Europe and Jews beginning to interact with modern European society in a new way, meaning for the first time, European Jews were having to negotiate a notion of a public national identity, for example, they are nationally German, they are part of the German nation state, but a private religious identity of Judaism. And it's the case that this tension didn't necessarily exist before. Now, for those Jews in Muslim lands, it was a different situation living under the Ottoman Empire and other areas within the Muslim world. And so here we have two photographs on the left. We have Jews from the Baghdadi community in Iraq. We have Jews on the right from the Egyptian community in Alexandria. And it's important to note that these are cultural groups that often sat at very high levels of society within Egypt and Iraq, respectively. These were very educated groups. And on the right here, we have a photograph of a girls' school in Alexandria, where we can see from the flag, their instruction was in French. Now, it's the case that not all Jews in Muslim lands were part of this more aristocratic educated class. And this was the case with many of the Jews in Yemen that were part of more poor elements of that society. Now, to understand anti-Semitism, where this fits, and really where we even come to the term anti-Semitism, it's important to show that as Jews were being emancipated and were being integrated as citizens into European countries, Simultaneously, what was known as scientific racism was unfolding broadly as part of popular discourse. Now, we know today that this is completely pseudoscientific, and while there's absolutely no empirical evidence to suggest that any of these notions that were shaping individuals in Europe's views of different ethnic groups 
At the time, this was seen as central to people's understandings of the distinctions between different ethnic groups, and in particular, the role of Jews in emerging European nations. And on the right, we have a photograph of Wilhelm Marr. He is a German provocateur and publicist and writer and public intellectual who actually coins the term in the 1880s anti-Semitism based on this notion of him feeling that we are actually going to see Jews as scientifically dangerous to German society. I see some questions here. We are studying the culture shaped in the 19th century. Um, let me continue. We're just starting to enter what is actually going on in the 1800s here. Now, in part of this notion of understanding how race science fits in to elements more broadly across European culture and Jews feeling of whether they're included in that, we see a very influential figure in Germany and in German pop culture, Richard Wagner, who is widely considered to be one of the greatest minds of music at the time, but also one of the most outspoken anti-Semites. And in an 1850 publication, right around the time of Jewish emancipation in Europe, Wagner releases an incredibly important document in understanding Jews' own relationship to their musical tradition, and likewise, what Jews were starting to sense their role may be within Jewish culture more broadly. Now, Wagner states as one small excerpt of this piece, we must explain to ourselves the involuntary repellence possessed for us by the nature and personality of the Jews so as to vindicate that instinctive dislike which we plainly recognize as stronger and more overpowering than our conscious zeal to rid ourselves thereof. So as a Jew in Germany, musician or not, in reading these words from the most deep elements of popular culture, we see that there is certainly a tension here. And many Jews in Germany started to feel that, quite frankly, they weren't going to be welcomed and included into German society. And this was the case across Western Europe as Jews were beginning to become emancipated. And in part, the German context led to a mass exodus of Jews to the United States, coming really in the mid 19th century and forming the reform Jewish community that is still the largest community in the United States today. Now, in Eastern Europe, where Jews became emancipated much later, we see that the Jewish communities are suffering, pogroms are becoming widespread as we get into the late 19th century. And beyond those existential questions of Western European Jews of integrating into national culture or not, in the Eastern European context, violence is extreme and emancipation has not occurred yet, which catalyzes very big questions about whether Jews are safe and whether Jews should stay in those Central and Eastern European communities. And this is where we see Zionism and the emergence of the new Jew and an emerging Hebrew culture really start to be a factor. Now, it's not the case that all European nationalist Jewish thinkers agreed that an exodus to Palestine and the creation of a new Jew with a Hebrew culture to set a Jewish society into Palestine in the historic land of Israel. And one of those thinkers is Simon Dubnov, who deeply felt that Jewish nationalism was important, but in his case, he felt that it was specifically something that should continue in Europe and that Jews should be able to develop their own sense of national autonomy within European society. And it is sad to note that Dubnov passes away, he dies, he's murdered in violence relating to the Holocaust. Now, as a result of fomenting violence in Eastern Europe and pogroms against the Jewish community, 
we see the first major group of organized ideological immigrants from Russia come to Palestine in 1882. This movement was known as the Bilu, the Biluim. And the first nucleus of this group photographed here arrive in Palestine, a group of 14 Russian students. There's another wave that come in 1884 and they start trying their hand at agricultural work, at labor valued Zionism. And it's the case that most of these individuals didn't really have experience as agricultural workers. And while they saw a lot of value in creating a new Jewish culture in Palestine around these notions of collective labor values, they largely failed at a lot of these early pursuits. And many of this original nucleus of immigrants to Palestine ended up turning around and going back to Russia. Now, it's very important to note that 1882 is well before the first Zionist Congress. And so we see that Herzl is certainly significant in organizing Zionism to a new level, and especially in 1897 with the first Zionist Congress in Basel, but we had ideologically motivated Zionism that was catalyzing immigration well before this point. And while Theodore Herzl is incredibly important in forming political Zionism and that element of the Zionist enterprise, we need to remember that there was immigration before. Now, when talking about Hebrew and Hebrew culture, it's important to remember in this notion of inventing Hebrew culture, Modern Hebrew had to be invented as well. And on the right, we see Eliezer ben Yehuda, known as the forefather of modern Hebrew, sitting in his library, toiling over the process of turning a language that was not a spoken daily modern language into one that could be the foundation of a new Jewish national culture in the land of Israel. And on the left, we have a photograph of Eliezer ben Yehuda's son, Ben Sion, who is known to be the first child to be raised in a home speaking modern Hebrew. So I see a question here. Was there any concurrent pushback of that idea? Anyone who said, hey, sure. Yeah, especially at the turn of the 20th century, at this point, when we have these very small groups of ideologically motivated Jews going to Palestine, there was lots of pushback. Most people, when they were thinking about leaving Europe to start a new life, went to the United States. And that was the case until 1924, when the US Immigration Act cut off those streams of immigration. And the question of immigration to Palestine becomes much more significant. But it's important to remember that at this time, at the turn of the 20th century, Lisa, that Zionism was part of the Jewish left wing. It was in many regards subversive. And in many regards, it was not popular. Now, it becomes more popular as political Zionism grows, but this is not the dominant notion of what Jews should do to recreate their lives. Yes, of course, there is evidence that we see other iterations of Hebrew being spoken, but there was a certain process that occurred at the beginning of Zionist immigration where Hebrew really was brought from a language that wasn't necessarily dead, but was not equipped to be a language that could handle a modern society. And we'll get into some of those tensions shortly. Now, part of the ethos of the new Jew and the new Hebrew culture that was being developed was working the land. And these often socialist labor values were very central to the notions of what it meant to be a Jew coming to the land of Israel. And physically working that land became an extremely important element of the emerging ethos. And part of this notion of egalitarian and socialist focused labor value was that women were to also be a part of this movement. Now, 
Is it the case that there were no tensions with women and there was no sexism? Certainly not. And there's a lot of scholarship that digs into issues of women in pre-state issue culture, but it is the case that women did actively take part in the process of rebuilding elements of the land of Israel and regions of the land of Israel. And it was likewise the case that they participated in the defense establishment. Now, something that is really interesting to note about this period is that in this secular focus and in this labor focus of Jewish life, yes, there was indeed a small Yemenite aliyah in 1882. Um, it's important to note, especially in the context of this article, Tal, in Israel National News, that that does have a right-wing political bend. And there were a lot of issues, in fact, with the Yemenites in that first Aliyah that were mostly focused in Jerusalem. Um, but yes, indeed, there were many Yemenites that came. And it's the case that of the dominantly European groups that made up the first Aliyah, there was actually a focus on there being a interest in Yemenite Jewish culture and idealizing Yemenite pronunciation of Hebrew words. The Ashkenazi way of pronouncing Hebrew words was largely thrown out and replaced with what was considered to be the Yemenite pronunciation. And this in part was relating to those small groups of Yemenites that did come as part of the first Aliyah, but also this was part of a greater notion of what European Zionists thought that Yemenite culture was. Now, within this notion of secular life, and I will explain Adlayada, um, I was just trying to respond to the question in the chat box. Adlayada was a festival centered around Purim that was part of this greater process of inventing a national culture. And the Adloyada was a parade that occurred in major cities across Palestine in the Jewish communities in the 1930s moving forward. And on the right, we have an example of the Adloyada celebration of the Purim celebration in this very secularized sense, a celebration that was part of the national culture based on Jewish ritual tradition, but in a new way where new ritual traditions that supported Zionist labor ideals were being created. And on the left, we have a photograph of an Adloyada in 2018 next to Kibbutz Steboker, where I lived as a graduate student doing my PhD at Ben Gurion University. Another extremely important notion within the development of early Hebrew culture is a notion of muscular Judaism largely put forward by Max Nordell. And in a letter to a gymnastics club in Berlin that had titled themselves the Bar Kochva Gymnastics Club after the leader of the 132 Bar Kochva revolt, Shimon Bar Kochva against the Romans, he states, the desire to take hold of a proud past finds a powerful expression in the very name chosen by the Jewish Gymnastics Society in Berlin. Bar Kochva was a hero who refused to suffer any defeat. When victory was denied him, he knew how to die. Bar Kochva was the last embodiment in world history of a battle-hardened and bellicose Jewry. So to get this sense that at this point in time, one of the central leaders in designing Hebrew culture and the Zionist ethos, feeling that there hadn't been a battle-hardened Jewry since the time of the Bar Kokhla revolt, it, it's very telling in what those who were forming Hebrew culture wanted to do in separating themselves from that diasporic past that they genuinely viewed as being weak. So I see another question here. We were taught in the 1980s that the Ashkenazim were rebuilding modern Hebrew and considered the Sephardic pronunciation more sophisticated or literary. 
So in the 1980s, we already see Hebrew as being quite developed. Um, are you, if you're referring to the 1880s, um, they saw the Sephardic pronunciation as being more native to the Middle East. And it's important to remember that part of the function of developing a Hebrew culture was creating a sense of indigeneity to Palestine amongst those European Jews that were immigrating there. And in returning to this notion of muscular Judaism, and oh, I see when I was in school in the 1980s, there's some elements of truth to that, but it's important to remember that a lot of the mythology surrounding the early development of Hebrew culture does not necessarily align with what actually took place. And personally, in the scholarly work I have done on this issue, I see it more as aligning with something that is native to Palestine, native to the Middle East, rather than something that was part of a diasporic European tradition. So in returning to muscular Judaism, part of the manifestation of muscular Judaism was developing a culture of sport within Hebrew culture and society. And part of this was the foundation of the Maccabi Games in 1932. And it's interesting to note that in looking at these Maccabi posters on the left, we see English writing. Now, it's the case that Maccabi was not necessarily just for those Jews who were in Palestine, but it was something that was actually intended to be an advertisement for the Jewish world writ large. And we see on the right, a delegation of Jews from Lebanon participating in the original procession of the Maccabi games. But we also see delegations from all over Europe and the United States as well for that matter. And it's the case that this was an opportunity for Zionists in Palestine to showcase muscular Judaism to the rest of the Jewish world. I know that these files are too large for guidebook, I will be happy to send a Dropbox link to this PowerPoint for anyone who's interested in using this. I'm happy to ship it. Now, another element of muscular Judaism that again is very important to the developing Hebrew culture and likewise to diasporic Jews is the warrior ethos. And well beyond sport, part of muscular Judaism was indeed a sense of developing Jewish society into warriors in a way that many of those early architects of Hebrew culture felt that Jews had not been for a period of time. And so likewise, we also see that this is a movement that included women. This was not just men who were participating in the warrior aspect of the development of the muscular Jew. We also see a deep musical tradition take form in the land of Israel. Now, to come back to these questions of early Yemenites in the Jewish community in Palestine in the Yeshuv, at the turn of the 20th century, there was a European immigrant who came to Palestine named Avraham Tzvi Edelson that in the early 1910s began a project to consolidate what he called a thesaurus of Jewish music, where he essentially created an encyclopedia of Jewish musical traditions from around the world. And in fact, heavily emphasized Yemenite and Middle Eastern Jewish music, seeing it as being something that is authentic to the Middle East. And by extension, extremely important in creating an authentic musical culture in the Yeshuv in Palestine. And we see elements of Eastern music and Eastern Jewish music being integrated into many elements of pre-state music, but by and large, folk music was the dominant form of popular music in the Yeshuv. And this was a form of music that 
became very much enmeshed in military tradition. And on the left, we see members of the Chizbatron, of the Palmach band. I see Rina has mentioned some of the names and likewise Chaim Hefer sitting at the front in addition to Naomi Polani and Ophir. And the Chizbatron and these individuals were some of the first real celebrities of Hebrew music and individuals that went on to have great careers in Hebrew music more broadly. Now, beyond folk music and musical tradition that we can see as part of folk culture and maybe a more lowbrow approach to culture, we also have the development of very highbrow culture, of high culture, of classical music. And here we have a photograph on the right of Leonard Bernstein coming from the United States to lead the Palestine Orchestra established in 1936 by Central European violin virtuoso Bronislav Huberman. And Bernstein came to Palestine to do a tour where he wanted to showcase his own connection to Zionism as an American composer, but also his support for the development of high culture in Hebrew society. We likewise see a strong literary emphasis represented by many literary thinkers and writers in the pre-state period. And here we have an excerpt from Chaim Bialik's poem on the slaughter. We see a deep emphasis in art. And in 1906, before the Technion or before the Hebrew University of Jerusalem were established, we have an art school. And it was established by Boris Schatz, a, oops, jump slides here, a painter and sculptor who came to the Yeshuv and established this school in 1906 already with instruction the year after that. And here we have a photograph of Schatz conducting a carpet weaving class in Bezalel in 1908. In 1912, we have the establishment of the Technion in Haifa. Now, today the Technion is still one of the most advanced technical colleges in the world. But at this time, as it was being developed, the question of what the language of instruction would be at the Technion was big. Now, there were those who thought that it should be in Russian because many individuals in the yeshuv at that time spoke Russian. And there were likewise many scientific publications that were being put out in that language. There were certain that thought German should be the language of instruction at the Technion because German was an important language in science more broadly in the world. And there was a camp that felt that even if it was difficult to further bend Hebrew into a modern language to a point where you could produce a scientific curriculum in Hebrew and produce publications on scientific matters in Hebrew, we see that that camp ended up winning. And even though it was controversial, this set the tone for Jewish society moving forward. Now, individuals like Bialik, well into the 30s, were known to walk down the streets of Tel Aviv speaking Yiddish. But Hebrew society more broadly was making a stance that Hebrew was going to be the language of speaking and the language of academic life, which brings us to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem established in 1918 with its Mount Scopus campus opening in 1925. Now, when we look at all these elements of early Hebrew culture, we essentially see the establishment of what is known as the Sabra ideal, which takes us from the establishment of Israel in May of 1948 forward into the period known as the period of Mamlach Tiyut into the 1950s and 60s, where culture idealized these Sabra elements, these elements of labor, of sport, of being a warrior, of working the land of Israel, of socialist labor values. And we can see these ideals being represented in a lot of popular books, one of which was written by Moshe Shamir, a book 
that in English is called with his own hands. In Hebrew, this is Bemo Yadav Pirke Elik. This is a story that is about Moshe Shamir's brother, Elik, who fought and died in the 1948 war. And this is a book that was widely assigned across schools in Israel and is representative of this era of Sabra writers that did focus on these elements of culture that were really developed in the pre-state period. We likewise see visual arts representing these statist mamlach tiyut and Sabra values. And here we see famed Israeli painter Nahum Gutman, educated at the Bezalel Academy, who did many landscape paintings of the land of Israel. And this is his painting, Galilee Landscape. Now, important to note is in the early period in the 1950s, in this time of Mamlach Tiyut, many early Israeli society did not know how to deal with the Holocaust. And in many regards saw the Holocaust as representing those very elements of weakness of diasporic Jewish life that they wanted to move away from in developing a new Jew, in developing Hebrew and Israeli culture and society. Now, this changed drastically in 1961 when the Mossad operation brought Adolf Eichmann, one of the architects of the final solution in the Holocaust, to trial in Jerusalem, where Holocaust survivors in Israel came and had the opportunity to give Holocaust testimony. Now, this Holocaust testimony where the survivors during the trial explained what happened to them, told the story of the injustices of the Holocaust, we see that not only did the world start to get a true sense of what happened. But Israeli culture, even at a time when there wasn't TV, this is 1961. So on the right, we see Israelis sitting in Jerusalem, listening to this trial and this testimony unfold on the radio. We see that this testimony softens Israeli culture as it relates to the Holocaust. And we can see this reflected in a lot of literature that is coming out at this point in the 1960s. And literary icon Amos Oz in one of his first major works, Where the Jackals Howl, a collection of short stories, takes on these issues. And in these stories unfolds some of these very nuanced and complicated tensions in Israeli society between Sabras and between those that came in the 1940s from Europe that were victims of the Holocaust and starts to unpack those realities. And so there is a story within where the jackals howl called the Trappist Monastery that I highly recommend all of you as educators and anyone interested in understanding this period of time in Israel that you read. This is also a time where we see an evolution of cultural tensions where part of the statist values were a pretty tight grip on Israeli culture. And David Ben-Gurion, for as noted of a leader as he was, and for as much as he did to develop the state of Israel, he had a very authoritarian view of Israeli culture. He did not support Israel having TV. And after Cliff Richard, British icon, pictured on the right, came and played a public concert in 1963, Ben-Gurion saw young Israelis dancing in a way that he was not comfortable with. And he, as a result, in 1964, when there was a proposal for concert promoters to bring the Beatles from England to Israel for a performance, Ben-Gurion ultimately struck this down and denied this 1965 Beatles concert from happening. I'll show a very quick clip here, but we can see some iconic music from this time unfold that is still very much in the fashion of the folk music that was popularized by bands like the Cheese Batron and other folk performers in the Yeshiva. <laughs> 
So in the interest of moving forward, I'm gonna cut this clip off just because we have a lot to cover, but we can hear the sounds of the music that was popular, but also aligned with what Ben-Gurion and his colleagues wanted Israeli culture to be. They did not want the Beatles and not necessarily rock and roll at this point in the 1960s, but things change moving forward. And well beyond rock and roll, we see significant changes by way of roughly 1 million Jews coming to Israel from Muslim lands in the 1950s and 60s, far expanding the cultural and political realities. Here we see photographs of Yemenite Jews coming in mass in the 1950s on the left as part of Operation Magic Carpet. And here we see a Yemenite Passover Seder in Israel in the 1950s. Now, this is a wildly different aesthetic for Israeli society. This is a very socially conservative group of individuals coming from religious societies, not secular labor-focused socialist societies. And this was a serious challenge to Sabra ideals and the Mamlach Tiyut ideals of what Israeli culture should be. Now, in addition to these cultural tensions, there were many economic problems in Israel in the 1950s. And even with the acceptance of German reparations, which injected billions of dollars into the Israeli economy, the Israeli economy was struggling and it took time to develop housing. And the solution to absorbing these hundreds of thousands of immigrants as they were coming in was to build temporary tent camps known as Ma'abarot, where some immigrants coming from the Muslim world had to stay for extended periods of time in what many considered to be squalor. And it's likewise important to remember that this tension between statist cultural ideals and the Sabra ideal and what these more religious communities wanted in terms of a cultural reality for themselves and a religious reality for themselves the two did not align. And as a result, many of these Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews felt like their culture was being debased. Now, in addition to these tensions of culture and the issues in the tent camps, we see the development towns start to come about. And the development towns were a series of small cities and towns that were built across the periphery of modern Israel, a project of Ben-Gurion and his associates. And here we see a photograph of a young Shimon Perez and David Ben-Gurion at the opening of one of these development towns. But many individuals felt that they wanted to live in Tel Aviv, or they wanted to live in areas where they saw Ashkenazi Israelis living, and not in remote areas that often required long trips to get certain supplies or to get themselves to work. And part of this was likewise a wave of new musical and other cultural traditions that came to Israel with these immigrants. And here we have a photo of one of Israel's first Mizrahi pop icons. This is Joe Amar, who arrives in Israel from Morocco in 1956. But as a result of not being able to launch his career, he in fact moves to Long Island in 1970, where he had a 20 year career as a cantor at a Long Island conservative synagogue. He did produce many Hebrew pop records in the Mizrahi style, but they were largely produced for an American audience at that point and not necessarily an Israeli audience, but we will see that later things start to change. And as we get into the 1970s, we see a protest movement evolve where in 1971, the Israeli Black Panthers, the Pentelim in Hebrew as they were referred to, developed a protest movement that they largely modeled off of the American Black Panthers. And here we see a picture on the left of a protest against the Labor Party and Golda Meir, but we see an evolving tension into the 1970s where many in the Mizrahi and Sephardic community see the Labor Party as being an oppressive force and an entity that debased their culture and did not align with their more religious and traditional values. And this in addition to 
what are seen as the blunders of the 1973 war, in part lead to Menachem Begin having an opportunity to reach out to this community that was feeling disenfranchised and to express an embrace of Mizrahi and Sephardic culture. And in part as a result of this, in 1977, Menachem Begin becomes the first Likud, the first conservative prime minister to win the premiership. Now, this is a time when we start to see Israeli power culture grow to become inclusive of Israeli citizens. And here we have a 1981. Now, Certainly a different musical aesthetic than we hear in Ashkenazi style folk music or other forms of rock and roll that in the 70s through globalism were starting to come to Israel well beyond Cliff Richard. But we see this music and these cultural traditions become more popularized and more mainstream in Israeli society, but we also see beyond Menachem Begin and the Likud party reaching out to the Mizrahi and Sephardic communities in Israel, we start to see the development of political parties specifically representing these interests, these differences between those original Sabra labor values and what was coming about to be a segment of society that was more socially conservative, that was more religious. And here we have a photo of Ovadia Yosef, the founder of the Shas party upon Shas's foundation in 1984. And it's important to note that at this time we see a bridge being built between Mizrahi and Sephardic identity politics, for lack of a better way to describe it, and the Likud party and Miri Regev of recent appointment to the Ministry of Sport and Culture, and someone that has really politicized Mizrahi and Sephardic culture and made that cultural connection to conservative politics and their outlets like Israel National News be something that has really become an issue that is quite divisive in Israeli society and plays into contemporary populist conservative politics in Israel. Now, one of the other things that happens in the 1970s is Israeli sport develops. And here we have a 1977 photo of the Maccabi Tel Aviv basketball team winning the, the Euro championship, putting Israel on the map so to speak, in this famous phrase, but more importantly, showing the world that it wasn't just wars that muscular Judaism could achieve, but that Jews were capable of being elite level athletes. Now, when we get to the 1990s, we see another layer of Israeli society evolve. See, more groups of immigrants come and challenge the systems that had been developed by those original immigrants from Europe and those few immigrants from Yemen, then challenged again by those Jews from Muslim lands. And then once we think maybe Israeli culture has hit a new level of being formed, the 1980s and 1990s changed things again when we have immigrants coming from Ethiopia and the former Soviet Union. After the collapse of the former Soviet Union, we can see nearly a million Jews from this area moving to Israel. Now, this wave of Jews brings with it many tensions. One of them, quite simply, is these Jews who had been living in the former Soviet Union and had many of the proteins that they had been used to eating before communism being taken away, and they had access to pork meat. And so this was a community of Jews that had been eating pork for decades and brought culinary traditions of including pork as an ingredient in their cuisine to Israel. And we know that during the 60s, many Israelis ate pork and it wasn't a big deal, but we saw it become an issue of identity politics and religious identity in Israel with this wave of immigrants starting in the 1990s. And with it, we also bring questions of who is a Jew. And it is the case that in Israel today, many individuals that 
made Aliyah of it, moved to Israel from the former Soviet Union, are in fact not considered to be fully Jewish in the eyes of the rabbinate, as a result, cannot be married in Israel. And so on the right, we have a photograph of a mass wedding that is taking place in Cyprus, where Israelis that are not considered to be Jewish are getting married so they can take their marriage documents back to Israel and show the state of Israel that they are married and be officially recognized as married couples. One of the other things that is happening is we're starting to see units forming in the Israeli army where young Jews that are of former Soviet descent in Israel have the opportunity to do a Orthodox conversion through their military units. And on the left, we have a madrich from one of these units and some young soldiers from the former Soviet Union considering taking on this next step in Orthodox conversion. And on the right, we have two soldiers in a similar unit visiting a settlement in the West Bank. Now, much like other things that we have seen, there are cultural reflections of these tensions in Israeli society. And I would like to bring to your attention Ukrainian-born artist Zoya Cherkovsky, who in her 2018 Israel Museum solo exhibition shows that again, we see tensions where another group of immigrants coming to Israel fit into these layers of different immigrant groups challenging each other, challenging notions of Jewishness, challenging notions of Israeliness, and adding to the rich diversity of Jewish life in Israel, but not without its tensions. We likewise see large numbers of Ethiopian immigrants coming to Israel in the 80s and 90s. Currently, there are about 150,000 Ethiopians in Israel. And much like we have seen with Russian Jews and Jews from Muslim lands, we have cultural output. And it fits into the institutions and the context of Jewish life, of the new Jew, of Zionism, of Israeli culture that were established in the pre-state period, but with new flavors, with new colors, with new aesthetics. And so here we have Ethiopian Israeli artist Herut Yosef. On the far left, a painting that was actually on display at the Atlanta Jewish Community Center, the Marcus Jewish Community Center, quite close to Rich's house in Dunwoody. But Heru Yosef was educated at Bezalel and adds new flavors and new aesthetics to Israeli culture and what it means to be a Jew in the land of Israel. Now, again, this group of immigrants has not integrated in Israeli society without tensions. And much like we saw with the Black Panther movement that was a part of the Mizrahi and Sephardi communities civil rights movement, we've seen the Ethiopian community in Israel, the former Ethiopian Israelis, look to American movements to try and establish some protest frameworks to shape what their civil rights movement looks like. And so we've seen photos across media in Israel and abroad of young Ethiopians in Israel adopting the slogan of Black Lives Matter. And so we see that there are connections between what are happening, what is happening in Israeli cultural developments, what is happening in Israeli social movements and the rest of the world. Now, we also see tensions in religious society. I'm not gonna to get too deep into these issues, but one of the things that has come up is the issue of young ultra-Orthodox soldiers and should these young men serve in the army instead of going to yeshivas. Now, in 2012, when the Tal law was repealed, it was the case that there was a legal mandate for many ultra-Orthodox Jews to join the military. It's not fully enforced, but it is still a major flashpoint. But it's not the only flashpoint in the tensions between secular and religious society. We see cultural tensions that erupt from the more conservative and religious elements that exist within the ultra-Orthodox community. And 
In 2019, when the Eurovision Song Competition came to Israel, it was the case that the Orthodox Jews were incensed that Eurovision would be filmed and aired on Shabbat. And here we have a video of young secular women taking off their shirts. <laughs> to show some of the nuances and complicated tensions that exist between secular and ultra-Orthodox society in Israel. Ah, so I was just saying, this was a video that, sorry for those that couldn't hear me, showing secular young women who took off their shirts and showed their bras to ultra-Orthodox men who could not in their culture see that to break up a protest of these young men who did not think that the Eurovision Song Competition in Israel should be aired on. We also see deep divisions when it comes to Arab society in Israel. And one of the ways that Israeli culture has really dealt with these issues is through a television show written by Saeed Kashua, a very known Arab Israeli author, journalist, and writer who wrote Arab Labor, a wonderful comedy that I recommend all of you watch and you can use as a tool to teach many aspects of Israeli society, but certainly those tensions between the 21% of Israel that are Arab versus the rest of the Jewish population. But Kashua himself got to a point where he felt that Arab society did not feel that it was part of his identity as an Israeli and he just did not want to deal with the tensions between what it meant to be an Arab citizen of Israel. And in fact, after the 2014 war between Hamas in the Gaza Strip and Israel, Kashua left. He took a position teaching at the University of Illinois where he is pictured here in 2018 and is now actually doing his PhD in literature at Wash U in St. Louis and I imagine will enter American academia at some point when we move forward into him receiving his degree and probably teaching at a university somewhere in the United States. Now we see sports evolve we see the adoption of new sports like lacrosse and baseball in Israeli society. We see evolutions in music where Mizrahi pop music has not just become popular, but it has now become popular in Judeo-Arabic. And so I will end on this note here where we have seen this evolution of ideas, of culture, of society, of immigrant groups where now some of the popular Mizrahi music is being performed by Israeli women. On the left, we have a photograph of Neda El Kayam, who is a Moroccan Israeli who performs traditional Moroccan Judeo-Arabic music in Israel and across the world. And on the right, the band Awa, a group of three sisters who come from a Yemenite Israeli family who sing songs in Yemenite Judeo-Arabic based on the cultural traditions that they grew up. Um, I'm sorry that we uh, had to cut off there, but this is a lot of history to pack into a 59 minute presentation. And so I tried to do my best to give broad strokes. Yes, some of those paintings, especially those representing those tensions between Russian Israelis and the rest of Israeli society are very powerful. But again, this fits into this greater framework of immigration more broadly. And in any immigrant nation, whether it be Israel or the United States, you will see this similar story of layers of immigrants and the tensions between them and these notions between immigrant groups of the newer immigrants feeling that previous immigrant groups are not kind to them or don't respect their culture. But again, this is by no means unique to Israel and 
There's even entire volumes of scholarly works dedicated to studying this around the world. So if this is something you're interested in, there is plenty of literature to dig very deep holes, even into the political psychology. I think also if you go back to that um, Cherkasi painting that you showed us, um, not the one with the rabbi checking their kitchen pots and pans, but the other one, which has the dark Mizrahi man, kind of man handling the blonde Russian woman. Um, I think that will fit very nicely into a discussion of stereotypes about black men. Um, and it, it was just kind of, you know, we kind of just skipped over that's not just tension between immigrants. It's when you look at the other person, what do you see? Now, when I look at that man, I see men in my family who I am related to, uh, which have just been caricatured into some sort of um, sexually harassing monster. And I think that needs, and you know, complete with, oh, that there's the picture of, of Rav Vadia on the wall. So I, I think that can get called out um, when we're having a discussion about what you see when you look at the other person, immigrant or not. Sure. Yes, these are complex and nuanced issues. And I think to your point and to Aaron's comment in the box, I really like your point here, Aaron, that yes, it shouldn't be, look, Israel has immigrant tensions. It's not an exceptional case. These are nuanced and complicated issues that we can fit into a global framework. This is not unique to Israel. And this is something that we can look as a case within a broad series of cases around the world in any immigrant population. And Israel is not immune to these tensions, certainly. Thank you for your comment. I want to say something about Syed Kishua. I met him in Middlebury because I teach in Middlebury and he came mm -hmm. and he spoke with the students sure. and he he said something very painful. He said that the only language that he can create in is Hebrew and he hates Hebrew because it's uh, the language that he feels it's the language of his occupier. So it was very hard to see somebody who is so, you know, locked in this personal conflict of and and that that's one of the reasons he left because he said he could not create in arabic 